This is The Saucer Life, a podcast in which we examine concepts, events, or people orbiting the world of flying saucers. Few preconceptions, snark when justified, no belief, no debunking. Today, we're continuing the story of Robert Renaud, a remarkably prolific contactee whose story began in the early 1960s. When we last left Bob, he had just toured an underground base in Massachusetts. His absence from the home he shared with his parents was covered by the presence of an alien doppelganger, and he has been gushing over an alien woman from Corindar named Lynn Airy, who is a psychologist, I believe. So now, let's head back to the 1960s. So, as we get further into Bob Renaud's 1960s contacts, we're going to begin with an account from January 4th, 1964, entitled California Base Tour. So this is another field trip to an alien base hard on the heels of his trip to the base near his house in Massachusetts. And I'm curious to see how he gets from Massachusetts to California. I assume it's a flying saucer. But before Bob gets into his actual story, he wants to, in his words, pause and reflect a little bit on the importance of the last few years of his life. That's how he phrases it. You know, his entire life has been leading up to this. How are the last few years of his life important because of these messages, these contacts he's receiving from Corindor or Corindor? I'm honestly not sure how to pronounce it. It's probably one of the two. I've always been a believer in flying saucers, ever since grade school. The possibility that we were being visited by people from planets outside our own has always held a special sort of intrigue within my scientifically oriented curiosity. Now mind you, I'm not saying that I took contact stories at face value. I was open-minded to them, of course, but it did not seem too wise to accept them without some kind of definite evidence. As you know, this evidence was rather unexpectedly supplied in July of 1961 when these riders of the silver discs chose to make contact with me. Since then, I have been given an entirely new philosophy of life, one that stirs within me a deep compassion and love for my fellow man on this and all worlds. It is a powerful desire to see our planet living in an ideal state of peace and unity through the brotherhood of all its inhabitants free from fear, hatred, suffering, and violence. I can only consider myself endowed of a special honor to be a small part of this great and wonderful intrigue, and to be chosen by our wise brothers from beyond the skies as their voice to my fellow man. In this appointment lies a deep and tremendous responsibility for me. I have been made one of the elite groups that our brothers have elected to carry out the work begun by the Master Jesus Christ so long ago. It is very humbling. And yet I derive no great sense of importance from this massive work of which I am a small part. We who have communicated with these advanced beings from such planets as Venus, Mars, Saturn, and Corendor have been charged with delivering this and future generations from the horrors of war into the glorious new age of truth, light, and love that signifies in accordance with the universal laws long lacking on Earth. So... He goes on to ask for the support of readers in the cause of peace and universal harmony, which he explains is a massive job, which makes sense, and can't be done alone, he says. He also talks about nuclear weapons again, making the actually fairly good point that if there are no actual concrete plans to use nuclear weapons, then why are we wasting time and effort and resources maintaining arsenals of nuclear weapons that – are just going to sit there. He says, quote, This money, which could be used to feed, clothe, house, and educate our underprivileged, is instead invested in war toys, end quote, and warns that if the arms buildup continues, there will eventually be some sort of devastating conflict. Bob describes the arms race as as kind of a, a piling up, a literal piling up of 
nuclear weapons uh, by by one side and the other, and they're they're separated. Uh, they're separated by a wall, and as each is 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 trying to to pile up their weapons to see over the wall and and to conquer what's on the other side of the wall, we are we are reaching a point where 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 things are going to get uh, dangerous. Uh, there might be a tipping over, and disaster will loom. He closes with a final appeal. It is up to us, dear brethren, to halt this piling up of. It is up to us, dear brethren, to halt this piling up of. It is up to us, dear brethren, to halt this piling up of weapons before anybody can reach the top, and eventually to have these lethal mountains of hellfire leveled and destroyed. This we cannot do by words alone. It requires action. My action. Your action. Every man's action. This must not be weak and loosely knit action. We must act in force as one great body. When it is seen that we are a dominant species, our leaders will agree to our demands for an immediate end to our warrior ways. Enough preaching. I must be about my tale. I must be about my tale. I love that. So his tale. It's 1 a.m. on a Saturday morning, and he receives a telepathic communication, really kind of a prompt more than a communication is the way he describes it. Anyway, he receives a telepathic nudge to go to his shortwave radio set. He gets some instructions and begins to get ready for his doppelganger to arrive. The Space Brothers show up around 4 a.m., and Bob is astonished to see that it is a different kind of craft that is transporting him this time. It is a flying craft that is hovering 500 feet in the air. The party is taken up into the craft by standing on a metallic disc, which is then lifted up into the ship by a blue beam. Now, the ship only has one room and seems to be controlled by a multi-armed robot. It's about 50 feet in diameter, the room not the robot, but despite not having a lot of different spaces, it still seems very well appointed. Around the wall, a long curving divan ran almost two-thirds of the way around the perimeter of the room. Across the middle of the room, separating the seating area from the control section, was a bookshelf stuffed with all varieties of literature. The top of it was four feet from the floor, and the remaining six feet to the glowing ceiling was taken up by a shimmering translucent wall of a plastic material that caught the control area's lighting, splitting it into very flitting patterns of every color of the rainbow. I found out that it was filled with the fluid of a varying refractive index that acted as a sort of unstable prism, much like the oil films you often see on a puddle of water seemed to be of many different hues. The floor in the lounge area was carpeted in a soft green material with the quality and thickness of the finest oriental rugs. It gave underfoot with a refreshing springiness that made it a pleasure to walk on. The walls were in a soft, non-glossy pastel shade of green that blended very tastefully with the carpet and the deep green divan. Between the windows were scenes of Corindor and the fabulous three-dimensional reproduction typical of their photos. These alone could keep our scientists busy for years trying to duplicate them. I like to think that those bookshelves are stuffed with the kind of literature as we saw last time, which is basically 1960s issues of Playboy that the aliens seem to enjoy, or at least Bob's doppelganger seems to enjoy. I like the idea of Bob's Doc Pulganger going to various newsstands around the uh, the Boston area, picking up you know copies of of '60s girly magazines and, and and just sort of stacking them on the shelves of this spaceship as the other space brothers get increasingly annoyed by it. So on this trip, Bob also describes the conversation that took place, which which actually, I didn't think about this, uh, sort of ties into the Girly Magazine thread. We spent the few minutes in flight resting on the divan and discussing women, God bless them, earthy admittedly, but then one can forever concentrate on ethereal philosophies. All work and no play make Jack a party pooper. I say this with the utmost sympathy and respect and, and indeed love, but I'm getting a huge sort of imaginary friend vibe 
from um, from from this from this conversation. We we talked about girls in the flying saucer, guys. You know, I'm cool. Uh, it, it it just seems it it seems endearing, honestly. Um, especially since we don't know what they said about women. Um, if we knew details, we, we might not find it so, so endearing. I, I'm imagining it like uh, some sort of sixth grader with a crush, but it, it was probably a bit more um, off color than that. After what seems like only a few seconds, the ship descends into another one of those entrances into the earth and down into the base, which is from what I could tell from the description, partially built into the ocean floor. Bob is pretty happy because his space sweetheart, Lynn Airy, and those are his words, not mine, space sweetheart, is there to greet him. She looks as beautiful as always. She's wearing a deep bluish velvet dress, a white blouse, and sheer nylons with white shoes. She looks very sort of early 1960s. Her beauty, Bob says, would put any of our Miss Universes to shame. Now, lest you think that is the the extent of Bob's praise of Lynn Airy. He continues, those lovely pools of blue, they could turn the coldest of men to butter in an instant. Forever they sparkle with the joy and love of life. Deep in them one can see great wisdom, and yet there is simultaneously the sensuality that makes a normally sane young man go completely frantic. Her eternal smile was a caress to the observer. It was not one of those flashy model smiles, but a natural expression of deep, undisturbed happiness a veritable command to those in her presence to join in her enjoyment of everything and everybody. When she speaks, one can hear the tinkling of Christmas bells, the laughter of children, the summer winds whispering through a tree and telling it things of sweetness. Mother of God, Bob, please settle down. Good grief. Uh, this is This is a great description, isn't it? Because it's 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 nice and sweet and 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 lovely and loving and everything but there's some odd there's some odd choices i could turn the coldest of men to butter in an instant well is is the butter these cold men turn into still cold because i've got a freezer full of butter and cold butter is hard as a rock i mean i should probably explain the freezer full of butter prices have been going up right so when butter's on sale we we sort of stockpile it because <laughs> I'm a man who uses a lot of butter. So I would have said something like those lovely pools of blue, they could melt the coldest of men like butter in an instant because butter, you know, apply some heat to it. It, it melts pretty quick. This has turned into a, a very butter centric podcast. So, so that I thought that choice was, was kind of odd. Um, when she speaks, one can hear the tinkling of Christmas bells, the laughter of children, the summer winds whispering through a tree and telling it things of sweetness. It that's that's a lot. Um, I, I, I like it. it. It's 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 very it's very charming. I, I get the impression if if the uh, if the sort of conversation with the the other fellows in the in the the UFO on the way to the base was kind of an imaginary friend sounding sort of situation this seems almost like a it's like a charlie brown and the little red-haired girl sort of sort of crush sort of thing they spend a lot of time touring the base it's it's very similar to the tour of the massachusetts base we go through room and room and room and they explain to bob the various technologies that are there like the like matter transmission it's basically a transporter from star wars a little bit earlier but not a totally unique idea and the pump room which you would think would involve a pump but this is where they process all the various atmospheric gases that people inside the base need to survive they also visit a room in which the space brothers monitor all the ufos that are in earth's airspace at any given time and can communicate can communicate with them and see through their sensors and things like that and they notice that there's a transmission from one of the ufos at that moment that that ufo is is sort of approaching a group of soldiers at a military base who have noticed the ufos and the space brothers and the the space sisters decide to have a little fun with the soldiers. Now, just to keep the alien name straight here, Astier is sort of the guy showing him around the base. And Lynn Airy, of course, is the psychologist who he is uh, very sweet on. As we watched in amusement, 
Astier sent the disc on a power dive right down at the men. One of them must have seen its motion in his peripheral vision. He looked up with a startled expression and yelled to his buddies. All of them stared wide-eyed, almost unable to move, as the three-foot disc flashed down at them. It missed them by about ten feet, traveling at least two hundred miles an hour, then vanished as Astier reactivated the optical shield. It stopped about twenty feet above them. He switched on the audio sensors, and we listened to them as they continued to look upward where they saw the last disc. Anyone want to tell me I didn't see what I just saw? Jack, if you're f***ing crazy, then we all are. So now what? Do we tell the brass or just shut the f*** up and it never happened? I don't know about you, but I never saw that f***ing thing. It must have been my imagination. Yeah, I didn't see it either. There ain't any flying saucers or little green men. I could go for a tall blonde alien honey right about now. Hey, you up there, you got any you can spare? His companions added their own shouted comments. Yeah, what about me? Hey, I want a redhead. Lynn Airy couldn't resist the temptation. She picked up a microphone, pressed the talk button, and purred seductively. I'm here, boys. Are any of you man enough for me? They took off at a dead run toward the edge of the field. The small crowd that had gathered to watch the fun laughed aloud as she said with, a fa- with feigned disappointment. Oh, well, I guess not. Astier smiled as he said, There are now seven more believers in flying saucers. It would be interesting to be in their barracks tonight. That may be one of the most outstanding bits of any contact account that I have ever read. Um, Now, I should be clear that Bob specifies in his 2008 updated footnotes that this is not what was printed in UFO International number 26 back in the early 1960s. He says what was published in that letter was an edited version more suitable to a 60s audience. He says this is what it really was originally when he saw it occur, Um, which actually this sounds like a realistic account. That doesn't mean I think it's real. It just means I think it sounds pretty realistic. Now, unfortunately, I don't have access to that issue of UFO International number 26. I I think the uh, AFUs, the Archives for the Unexplained's uh, collection goes up to number 22 or 23. And I I did check, but um, because the chapters are are numbered a bit differently from what's on the website, but I don't have access to that. So I don't know what the original thing is was or the original the original thing that's nice and nice and concise the original sort of account of that dialogue i don't know what that actually was but i like this idea of the the space brothers and and space sisters just sort of uh, just sort of jerking around the humans and uh, having a little fun I, i that's what i'd do if i had control of little flying saucer drone things so Fun time is over, and we get more discussion about how they track flying saucers around the world. And then we get a sidebar as Bob decides to wax philosophical once more. I digress at this point to meditate briefly. We of Earth are still struggling along in our space programs with monstrous, raucous, foul-smelling fire belchers in an attempt to place our people in the space-traveling fraternity. While all of this is transpiring, I watched as a man is transported in the space of a breath something in excess of 7,000 miles with no fanfare, no noise, nothing but what apparently was an ordinary, everyday occurrence. Indeed, what we have been told must be true, that when a planet's people work together with nature, then nature gives willingly of her many secrets to those who seek. These wonderful beings have not turned their inventions and discoveries against one another in hatred or war. Instead, they have applied their knowledge for man's benefit, for his comfort, for his service. Because of this essentially humanitarian and philanthropic philosophy, they have been the benefactors of many of nature's wonderful forces that lie hidden from us, behind a dark cloud of our own making, a cloud composed of our hatred, our insincerity, our despair, our prejudice, and our greed." How great it would be if our people could but once see how they live who do not wish upon others' misery and sorrow, but only joy and peace. This would indeed inspire our people to better things, and we would doubtless reap the rich harvests of knowledge and progress that would give to us our long-sought-after happiness. It is truly uncomfortable that the many do not choose to pause a few moments from their daily lives and consider the promises of a more fruitful life that have been made to us by our own men of peace, by our brothers, and by the Infinite One. Such a daily meditation would encourage our people to throw off the bonds of slavery to our warlike ways that have so long shackled us. 
To this end, many books have been written, many words have been spoken, and many thoughts have been expressed. Yet we of earth cannot see beyond our selfishness and inconsiderateness. We continue to live in fear and indifference, guided only by our instincts, to live at any expense. When many feel this way, there surely can be only war and suffering because it is only that kind of insane action which can satiate this animal instinct for self-preservation. Look up, therefore, and see these shining disks in our skies. Think about this. In those lovely machines are people who have gone through our present predicaments, and who, because of love and human decency, have overcome these trials, and now live in a world of true freedom and peace. When you acknowledge that we, too, are able to see in our time this blissful life, then you take the first step toward bringing to earth this life. That was a little long, but I thought it was important to give you an idea of of just how sort of extensive the, I guess, sermon might be a good word, the homily inserted into uh, into these sort of goofy space age contact tales of Bob Bernard's actually are. Uh, this is this is pretty lengthy, and it's it's interesting, and you know the the cynical side of me uh, says, yeah, right. Why can't we have a space program where we use technology we don't yet possess? Um, it just makes sense. We all just sort of live in harmony with nature and then nature gives us the solution. Um, and, and here's the thing. I, I'm not always seeing a direct connection between the daily meditation and the attitude changes and the sort of spiritual side of it and the technological advancement. Like a lot of contactees, Bob's ideas sort of exist in isolation from each other. There's the technological silo. There's the geopolitical silo. There's the spiritual silo. But the connections between the silos are somewhat lacking. All the parts of a system are here, but the actual system never quite uh, is, is never quite fully formed. But one thing that that struck me as I as I looked at this this sidebar is that and in my in my writing and research and, and on the podcast maybe i haven't emphasized this enough I, i've talked about how there's really not a lot new in the uh, in a lot of the spiritual aspects of contactism a lot of it is recycled from theosophy and, and other uh, other sort of occult traditions but at the same time there is not a lot in the geopolitical stuff that is uh, that is new. There is a lot that harkens back to internationalist movements of the uh, the immediate post World War One era that saw the emergence of the League of Nations and the uh, the World Council of Churches and other multinational groups um, comprised of activists who say, "Look, there are better ways to use our resources," and, and usually those were focused on. On social uplift, economic advancement, international peace, and things like that, and the, the spiritual elements were even even among religious organizations like like the the Council of Churches. You know, sort of sort of these religious and spiritual acts aspects are in the service of the brotherhood of humanity, or the yeah, that, that's the sort of phrasing they use. You know, the sort of gendered brotherhood at the time. But uh, that, that's what a lot of the contact deist stuff. Contact deist. I like that. The contact deist stuff is like uh, sort of sort of geopolitically um, a, a little naive, um, uh, but but naive in a in a way that that serves humanity in a sense. And if it if it seemed if it didn't strike me before that that this was something more recycled than I thought. Um, I, I don't know why. The only thing I can think is that by the 1950s and especially by the 1960s, this kind of of sort of Wilsonian internationalist type of thing had uh, had really gone by uh, by the wayside in a lot of ways. But um, th- this wasn't in my script, all of this. I, I just sort of realized that listening to the um, his meditation there. So, um, yeah, we should get back to, uh, to to Bob's story, but that's just a, a little thought I had about uh, sort of the geopolitics of contactism. Actually, I think this would be a good point to take our uh, our break, looking at the uh, looking at the clock. So let's take a break, and then we will uh, continue talking about Bob Renaud's visit to the California undersea, underwater, underground base. <laughs> If 
If you like The Saucer Life and you want more, you can support us in exchange for bonus content, episodes, little videos, outtakes, um, all kinds of stuff. You can check it out at patreon.com slash chizomedia or via the link in the show notes. You can also check out past episodes at saucerlife.com or your favorite podcast app. And as always, uh, at least for the moment still, we're on Twitter and on Instagram at Saucer Life, on Facebook at, I think, The Saucer Life Podcast. Search for that. You'll find us. You can email us at thesaucerlife at gmail.com or contact us by post at Chizo Media, P.O. Box 68, Grand Blank, Michigan, 4848. Zero, And we've got some uh, feedback, questions, comments, etc. from the first part of our Robert Renaud episode uh, over on the Patreon. Um, Black Wolf says, uh, there's a bit of this island earth in there, home delivery of mind-bending technology and Bob's own version of the tubes, man. Needs more Doug Exeter, though. Agreed. Um, and and Black Wolf, oh, Black Black Wolf over on on Twitter, uh, he's multi-platform, folks, uh, said uh, that he always loves an interocitor reference and wonders if, like Tom Servo, he uses it to make hot chocolate. Um, this Island Earth was the uh, the movie selected to be riffed in the, um, I think, underrated uh, Mystery Science Theater 3000, the movie, which I was fortunate enough to see in the theater back in, I think it was 19. 19- 96. He also wonders, um, what is it with these leering, horny contactees and that Lynn Airy does seem tops in shapeliness. Um, and, uh, Laura over on the Patreon says just once I would like to like a contactee to meet a female alien and not describe her physically, but mention that she has a great personality. Agreed. Uh, Maynard on Twitter recommends that we hide our porn from the aliens. Always a good, uh, a good choice. Uh, Caleb, um, one of our patrons, says, I enjoyed that the Space Brothers used advanced recording technology to air JFK's funeral on what seems to be basic cable or perhaps basic space cable. Do you think that when the humans developed streaming television services, the Space Brothers were like, "Ugh, why didn't we think of that? Yeah, I I think it's interesting that um, and, and of course, you know, there are obvious reasons for this, um, but I think it's always interesting that the uh, the technology of the Space Brothers is is not always it, it, not always, but very very often completely imaginable to the reader. It it is not that different from where we can sort of anticipate our own technology being in a generation or two. Uh, There's rarely times when contactees report back. It's like, I saw things that I can't comprehend and I don't have the words to say. And I have had some kind of, you know, breakdown. Now, if you want to sort of give the contactees the sort of benefit of the doubt about this, you can say, well, maybe the technology was far and away uh, more more advanced than what we are used to, but the space brothers presented it in a visual form, a visual and and tactile form that was familiar. So as not to completely break a contactee's mind kind of in, in the sense of, of yes, on star Trek, it's the 23rd and 24th century, but boy, those starships seem to to operate with big chunky plastic switches or touch screens that are kind of like what we use. Well, that's because visually they have to present it in a way that, that we understand. Um, I, I wonder if the same thing is true of, uh, of contactees, assuming that these things are all real. Um, uh, Laurel over on patron paid over on patron over on uh, Patreon says, if this were real, the admission that, Oh yeah, we don't really understand how this technology works ourselves, but we zap people's brains with it all the time would be really worrying. Also pretty funny that he waxes horny about Lynn Aries figure only to then describe her as wearing ski gear, which gives everyone the figure of a baked potato. Also the letter from the small alien child is precious. Yes. I loved the, the alien kid letter. I thought that was, um, that was pretty good. Um, Gabriel McKee, a longtime listener and friend of the show, um, puts his research skills to use to tell us uh, that as for the phrase ufologer, it may not be pretty, but it was in use early. The ufologer was the title of a Washington DC zine launched in 1957. So ufologer is definitely a term that has been out there. 
We got a couple of emails as well. Um, Richard emails to say, I really enjoyed the episode on Robert Renaud. I found it really interesting that Renaud would describe the alien's translation devices needing both sounds and mental imagery. This reflects an old-fashioned, though not outdated, a structuralist notion of language as a system of signs composed of a sound pattern or sound waves and psychological parts or word images and concepts, which are correspondences of delimited areas of the amorphous masses of sound and thought, as first defined by Ferdinand de Saussure. I don't know if Renaud was familiar with Saussure's course of general linguistics. In any case, beings of such advanced knowledge and technology shouldn't need a complex system. Good old humans have been able to learn languages they knew nothing about just from interacting with people without any kind of telepathic support. I personally know, for instance, of an Albanian immigrant to the U.S. who learned English from scratch by watching Sesame Street. That's really interesting. And uh, you would know more about that than I would, and most of our listeners probably would because I'm, I'm not really up on the linguistic stuff. But it's always struck me as – I don't know. I, I think I've met, mentioned this before, but but the idea that that alien beings um, would be so much like us that they would process language and images and words and everything in a way that is recognizable to us. Now, if, if we are all sort of cosmic re- cosmically related, that makes sense. But um, I, I find it very interesting, and I, I didn't know this before I, I read your email, Richard. That uh, that that the way Renaud describes. Their, this conception of language you know, fits in with an actual linguistic theory. I, I, didn't, uh, I didn't understand that before, but now um, I find that very, very interesting. One final email from someone signing themselves the exiled and exalted 10th member of the nine, which I like. Um, this, is, this is not related to Renaud, but it's about contacteeism more generally. As someone who is part of an academic field, history, and has a strong understanding of its function to discover, dissect, and disseminate, what recommendations do you have for ufology in terms of first principles, goals, and methods? How can someone or anyone either find true answers or investigate? Okay, that's that's the first part. Um, So I think this is the way I always sort of sort of see it is that that contact deism or, or ufology in general, but, but contact deism is sort of the thing I get into a bit. Um, th- th- you can sort of look at it as a, a cultural phenomenon that can be viewed or examined through a variety of lenses. There's the, the sort of historical aspect of looking at these primary sources from ufology and using them to gain a broader understanding of the world or or a particular nation at a given time. Um, You can look at the historical development of UFO belief over the decades, the way it it twists and turns and and evolves and things like that. You can look at, use the tools of a historian to sort of understand that. You can look at it from a more um, sort of not explicitly historical cultural, uh, cultural theory perspective, which makes my head hurt. So I'll leave that to others. There are sociological aspects to consider. You could probably do sort of economic and, and socioeconomic class analyses of ufology. You could look at it through the lens of gender um, and sexuality. You can uh, take a religious studies approach as scholars have been doing for uh, for decades, really the, the first scholars to really look at um, at the UFO movement and contactees in particular were um, some some really good uh, religious studies folks back in the uh, the late 60s and into the 1970s. You can um, you can look at the development of UFO stories and tales in terms of um, as a modern folklore. You can look at all of those things, but I'm not sure you're going to find some true answers about what people are seeing in the skies. You can find all sorts of answers, uh, true answers about how people have described or reacted to the things seen in the skies over the years. But as for what they've actually seen, I'm not sure. As far as investigating um, sightings or, or encounters, I think um, – from my historical perspective and, and uh, my friend Paul Kimball sort of mentioned this first mentioned this about 10, Oh gosh, 10, 15 years ago. Now that uh, one of the best sets of tools that a UFO investigator could have is, is to, to basically learn how oral historians interview subjects and um, avoid asking 
leading questions and know how to, to, to ask good follow-ups and, and things like that. Okay, next, uh, number 10 says, do any contactees or other ufologists make note of what is very clearly to me reads as, I guess, positive colonialism in contactee encounters? This is an interesting question because the, 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 the sort of topic of, of, of colonialism and imperialism and things like that is, is, a, is a very, very massive and significant one. And one thing that, that sort of jumps out to me is in many contactee cases, there is a um, – in accounts and encounters and, and things like that, in the manifestos that um, – manifestos disguised as UFO books that accompany them, there is a sense of of the enlightened, advanced people have come to the benighted, horrible place and are providing information that will – you know, make things all better. These advanced people from across the sea of stars know how to make things, uh, know how to make things better. And it, it does, um, it does present as a, a sort of, sort of the, the happy, shiny, sort of sparkly, clean, good facade of, of how colonialism has presented itself. You know, we're, we're providing uplift. We are, um, we're, it's, it's benevolent. Um, I think one difference in the way that a lot of contactee stories, um, present this, and there are exceptions as we will see after the break is that usually there is some kind of non-interference thing. Um, they're presenting us with the information, but we have to embrace it ourselves here on earth as, as opposed to it being being imposed on us. But, but in general, yes, there, there is, I, I think there are extreme overtones of colonialism in a lot of contactee encounters. And, and that would actually be a pretty good conference presentation for a UFO conference or a real conference. Um, yeah, I'm going to, going to think about that because that's, it does, it does come out. It does come out quite, quite a bit. And I'm not, um, I'm not as thoroughly up to date on modern academic studies of sort of colonialist culture and overtones and, and, and things like that as I, I should be. But just from my not an expert on this aspect of things perspective, there, there definitely seems to be some parallels. Thank you so much for that email. I, I love, I, I, I sound like I'm, like I'm being sort of fawning and fulsome and whatever, but I seriously think that the saucer life has the most erudite listeners in all of paranormal podcasting. And with that, um, with that very gracious compliment out of the way, let's get back to, uh, to Bob Bernard and this encounter in California. <laughs> So Bob is continuing his tour of the California base and visits, among other things, what can only be described as a television studio. Um, there's a computer complex, sort of computer room, and a large hangar with various scout craft in it. But the climax of the encounter is meeting with two men. One of them we have met before, but the other is a new face. Now, Bob is in one of the big lounge rooms, which like the lounge room in the Massachusetts base from the last episode and, and the, the sort of a, accommodations in the craft through which he was transported to this base. It's gorgeous. It's got the, the carpet. It's, it's got the, the, the couches or divans. Um, it's got all the stuff. And, and Bob is sort of hanging out, waiting for the guests to arrive and, um, and just sort of thinking about how wonderful it is to know all these people from, uh, for, from Corendar. My self-inspection was interrupted by the two great men that entered quietly into the lounge. I instantly recognized my old friend, Master Kalen Lee, and we all stood to greet them as they joined us. The other came directly over to me, took my hand in the usual hand clasp, and said, I am pleased to meet you, brother. There is one more guest coming that just arrived from Corindor. He asked to be here as well. As he finished speaking, a young man, apparently about 25 years old, came through the door. Master Kalen Lee introduced him. Bob, this is Altim Vedra, the president of Corindor. Whoa, Nelly. 
When I caught my breath after the shock of that one, I asked no one in particular if the Emperor of the Universe was waiting in the wings. The jest evoked warm laughter from my illustrious companions. I like the whoa Nelly there. Um, He really sort of goes overboard on, oh my gosh, I can't believe it's the president of the whole planet, which which there's a little bit of, I don't know if incongruity is the right word, but it's sort of, sort of funny. He's got this, this this total shock at meeting the president um, when he is standing in an alien base deep below the Pacific ocean off the coast of California, when he has ridden in flying saucers, when he has met an ascended, an ascended master, when he is sort of crushing on a beautiful alien psychologist, but no meeting, meeting the president of the alien planet. That's what really, what really blows him away. Now the president doesn't waste any time before getting down to the business of talking about a lot of geopolitical things that are going on on the planet Earth during the early 1960s here. We are we are after the assassination of President Kennedy in our Bob Renaud timeline and there are of course continuing concerns about the Cold War. But President Altim Vedra um, has some perhaps comforting news for Bob and really for all of us. You have no doubt noticed during the past months that there has been a gradual increase in international cooperation between the USA and the Soviet Union. We can tell you now that one of those whom we have been psych printing these days is none other than Premier Nikita S. Khrushchev. We were also transmitting to President Kennedy before his tragic departure. We have now set up a worldwide program of psych printing to include all the major leaders of the world, and in the U.S. and Russia, this includes members of the respective governments other than the president or premier. In the U.S., for example, we are working on the senators, the representatives, and the cabinet officials. I, for one, am glad the aliens are using their mind control, I'm I'm, I'm sorry, psych printing rays to influence the government's of the planet. That sounds like a fabulous idea. I'm not certain how I feel about this sort of narrative strand where the Space Brothers are actively influencing things to this degree. And I mentioned talking about that that one email during the break that that usually there's this non-interference policy that Space Brothers operate under. But with the Corendians, that doesn't seem to be the case. And this is this is kind of unusual, and I'm certain Renaud would argue that the psych printing doesn't control anybody's actions. It only provides influence and 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 sort of feelings that hopefully they will they will act upon. But at the same time, it's it's a little it's a little disconcerting. It's we're, we're not maybe this is the wrong way to think about it, but we're not in the 50s anymore. Um, Things have gotten rough. A president's been assassinated. The war in Vietnam is 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 starting to heat up, and we've got to do something serious. The Corendians might think to themselves before these humans destroy themselves completely. The president also has some good points to make about how the American economy works, or rather, how it doesn't work. You are seeing it become common where a certain product overloads the market to the point where it cannot possibly be consumed. This leads to wasted material, manpower, money, and time. On the other hand, there are things that are sorely needed by your people and yet are being manufactured by only a few companies. Among these is a low-cost automobile of a price under $1,000. There's also a need for a self-contained power source for the home to make such things as power failures obsolete and bringing electricity to everyone, no matter how far from a city or utility. Also, I might name a food which is practically waste-free and a means of containing it in a consumable package, also a way of processing it cheaply so that it might be stored for indefinite periods. These are within your industry's reach. You know that you have an excess of radios, hair dryers, and electric toothbrushes. Why not employ the out of work in producing the necessities that you now lack? Another point I might mention is that I have heard many of your roads are in rather sad condition. This in itself suggests a source of work for thousands, if not millions. 
why not reclaim your deserts? Build huge distillation plants to convert seawater to a more useful form, or set up operations to eliminate slums and cities. All these programs would have a stimulating effect on your economy, and would certainly give you enough work to keep your entire population busy for years. I don't understand why you silly humans don't just solve your problems. Um, that's kind of the vibe I get. Uh, it, it's 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 like the president is suggesting sort of New Deal work programs, only without the consideration of paying for these programs. They they seem to forget that money is an issue that needs to be dealt with, unless it's making a low cost automobile of a price under a thousand dollars. I was going to go down a rabbit hole of car prices in 1964, but I decided that my time was better spent (laughs) doing almost anything else. And I am, I'm interested in, in the food he might name, which is practically waste free and a means of containing it in a consumable package that can be stored for indefinite periods. This, it sounds like a strange sort of riddle, uh, suggestions, in the, uh, the, the comments on social media and through email are welcome as we try to determine what food this might be. Now, on the subject of economics, we, we, we do know from the last episode that the Carendians support Gabriel Green's theory of prior choice economics. So I'm sure this would, uh, this would work into this somehow. But uh, the president doesn't bring up prior choice economics in this particular discussion. Of course, geopolitics is never far from the main topic of conversation when talking with any Carendian official, and the president does return to geopolitics with a discussion of the situation in China vis-a-vis communism. Another topic that I should like to discuss is the policy of ignoring communist China. It seems to me that it should be evident by now that whether or not the United States and its allies care to admit that such a place as Red China exists, it will continue to be there. If left unchecked by keeping it out of the United Nations, it will become a major world power. I'm sure that no one would like to see the militaristic dictatorship of communist China become an influence on those striving for peace. How, though, can you control a disease by hiding your head in the sand and pretending it will cure itself? France had the courage to admit that the policy of ostrichology, as I call it, is not only ridiculous, but actually dangerous. The United Nations should immediately take in Red China, if only to keep her under control. I am sure that her one more vote won't change much if, in admitting her, many uncommitted nations swing toward the Western Bloc, if only for protection. Who knows? Maybe it is possible that by granting communist China admittance, she will soften her stance. You must admit that in any case, the present position of the U.S. and its allies is a bit inclined toward wishful thinking. You should reconsider this policy before it proves to be your great mistake. Just to get it out of the way, yes, question that sort of seems kind of cynical and and ignores the whole way that contactee narratives are, but... How do the Carendians know what an ostrich is, much less the ostrich's propensity to stick its head in the sand, supposedly, when there is danger? How do they know about the ostrich and this cliche about the ostrich so thoroughly that the president has coined the term ostrichology? Um, uh, because none of these, this story isn't real, and this is a vehicle for Bob to talk about his foreign policy ideas. That, that's why, of course. So, that's out of the way. But this is this is actually not bad. And what's interesting is on the website, Bob has his usual caveat um, that this was, you know, an old an old thing. And he says, as this is committed to the computer, the conditions in the world have drastically changed, Bob says, with communism all but destroyed. The only remaining communist nation of the world of world significance is China. The Carendians have freely admitted that they erred greatly in their analysis of China. That's what Bob said in the 2000s when he put this on his website. But I don't think the Carendians were wrong that the United States would have to deal with the People's Republic of China in some way. Now, putting it in the United Nations as a way to keep a check on its growing power, I'm not sure that's 
totally what um, would have been the best idea. But it was only a few years later in 1967 that former vice president and future president Richard Nixon wrote his um, his article Asia After Vietnam in uh, Foreign Affairs magazine where he saw that that there was going to be a pivot toward the Pacific, uh, the Pacific Rim nations, including the People's Republic of China by the United States in the near future and that it was necessary you know, sort of geopolitically. So I don't think the Carendians – are too far off the mark here. Although I really would have completely freaked out in a good way if there had been some mention of them psychoprinting a certain politician named Richard Nixon about this matter. So if the Carendians had actually influenced Nixon and 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 Kissinger to to engineer the um the, the sort of process of opening up to China that happened in the early 1970s, that would have been uh, that would have been outstanding. So the, um, the 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 sort of visit ends soon after that, but there is an interesting postscript added to the the online version that includes a a photo of a uh, a, a an attractive blonde woman, and, and it's a photo that, that it's a photograph, but it's been digitally retouched, and and this postscript reads as follows. And and this this took me by surprise when I first read this. Because I see a picture of an attractive blonde woman at the end of this and I think, "Oh wow, it's a picture of what Lynn Airy looks like." Listener, that is not the case. This is strange. Omitted from this report was a very personal 15 minutes or so spent with a young lady named Astra Lari while my party had been occupied with some base business that required their attention. At the time of our visit, she was working in the computer room. We hit it off instantly. Over the course of months, my relationship with this lovely young lady grew closer and more intimate until it reached the point where there was no longer any question in our minds about what was happening and where it was leading. Our union has only grown stronger as the years have passed, and the promise of a new life with her on her homeworld at the end of my time here is a source of peace and contentment. Some things are, to use a most appropriate phrase, written in the stars. The graphic scene here was brought to my attention by the Carendians. It is the work of an unidentified computer artist who has been inspired, shall we say, to create this beautiful work of digital art. The Carendians directed me to a page where the image was found, and I instantly saved it to disk. This image is a close approximation of Astra Lari's face when in her present Terran form, although her hair is somewhat longer than in the graphic. My great thanks to the unknown artist. Whatever his intention might have been in creating this image and whomever he might have used as a model, his work served a purpose of which he most likely will never have an awareness. Well, this kind of comes out of nowhere, right? I mean, just out of nowhere. Oh, by the way, there's this other woman, not uh, Lynn Airy, but Astra, Astra Lari. And we're, we're going to spend the rest of our afterlife together. Once I'm dead, I'm going to be able to be with her on her planet. Now, I think I mentioned last time on the um, TerraCore site that has all of Renaud's saucer contacts and writings uh, there is a massive massive amount of stuff so i went looking for further stories about astralari and he he sees her again on a uh, a trip to the moon in 1967 and they uh, they they hold hands a bit but that is about it on his on his first trip um but on the second trip he is uh, he is he's able to to see her and he he gushes about her and things and then there's a contact in March 2007 that he's titled a love written in the stars which is an account of what he calls a very personal trip to Corindor um in March of 2007 so there's a link in the show notes to these uh these sites or the site where you can find all of these things and we may return to to more bob renaud in the future but one last encounter or transmission i want to talk about uh, on the show today is from uh february of 1964 at 0100 hours it's a communication from lynn airy and it's entitled sex and the population explosion 
Lynn Airy begins by talking about the the way that the population and the, the expected growth of population is is going to outstrip the resources available to the planet. She points out India and China and nations in South uh, South America um, that have uh, you have large populations and and the, where the population problems are worst. She, she says um, she says Africa is an exception because quote it is mostly jungle. She says what we need to do is educate parents on, quote, the advisability of small families and the means of obtaining the full enjoyment of marital privileges without the usual consequences, the exact means we will discuss later. So, end quote. So education, access to birth control, things like that. Again, much like the, uh, the sort of geopolitical peace notions, international cooperation notions, the Corendians discuss uh, these concerns about population, about uh, birth control education, family planning. These are things that were very much in currency in the mid 1960s. Maybe not on the nightly news, but certainly among among people who were concerned about such things. It's not just married men and women just having too many babies that is the problem. There is another social issue that can also be um, be solved by education. Next, we have the alarming number of unwed mothers in all nations. This is due in part to the lack of comprehensive sex education and the great number of restrictions and unrealistic taboos associated with sex. By this, we mean that it seems to be human nature to engage in the forbidden and mysterious. I should estimate that 95% of the unwed mothers were never given realistic sexual training and had no idea of the consequences, physically and socially, that accompany indiscreet capitulation to the pleasures of union. The male partner in the act is equally ignorant of the liabilities involved. As we see it, the main motivation is the lack of understanding, the clandestine secrecy, the beckoning mystery that surrounds sex, making of a process that is good and wholesome an object of unhealthy curiosity. In many cases, to the extent of cultist devotion to it, as witnessed in the early phallic cultures. What could possibly be more appealing to the young adults of your world than seeing for themselves what it is to consummate their passions? Their parents have hemmed and hawed so much that there is only one way to obtain a working knowledge of biological processes. By experimentation. Now, I wouldn't call it a New Year's resolution, but I am going to somehow work the phrase indiscreet capitulation to the pleasures of union into conversation. Um, I'm going to aim for once a month. It, uh, it, it might not, um, it might not happen. Honestly, be, by the time I hit stop on this recording, I will probably forget that I was going to do that. But isn't that a great phrase? Indiscreet capitulation to the pleasures of union. Um, there is no way to make sex sound less interesting, um, which sort of works against uh, Lynn Airy's whole notion here that uh, that sex is mysterious. Therefore, we want to uh, we want to try it. There's something to that, I think, uh, for the young people of uh, of the time, maybe the young people of all times. But um, it's 1964. We you know, it's the age of um, wider access to birth control, although in some places still illegal for unmarried people until Supreme Court decisions later in the decade. But um, it, it's interesting because, you know, education, family planning, that this is not, this is not, you know, unknown topics of conversation terrestrially, much less on an inter uh, interstellar or intergalactic basis. It, it goes on to, to talk about various means of birth control, uh, criticizes the Roman Catholic church for its uh, prohibition on birth control, discusses um, vasectomies and, and tubal ligations. Also says there are uh, primitive, vicious and immoral ways of preventing contraception, including castration and uh, in the female, the remo- removal of equivalent organs. And then it, it, uh, Lynn Airy makes reference to barbaric cultures that perform uh, female genital mutilation, uh, which I didn't – now, talk about things that were maybe not current topics of conversation in the early to mid-1960s. Female genital, genital mutilation is probably on that list. So um, full points for bringing that uh, important issue to um, to the fore. I, I 
this might be the only contactee document I'm aware of that discusses this. So this is um, this is this is interesting. It's um, an instance of a, a contactee um, experience discussing social concerns here on Earth, but with a level of specificity and granularity that you don't often see. And I, I think it's 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 very different from his trips to the bases in Massachusetts and California. And I think it's a nice, a, a nice coda to that, to, to sort of explain that, um, you know, Renaud was a remarkably broad person in terms of the topics he covered. And, and that's the thing as we come to the end of this, uh, of this episode, um, of our sort of examination of Bob Renaud is that there's really no way to, within sort of the con- confines and format of this show to go into a deep dive on all of Renaud's contacts and writings because it, you you could do a Bob Renaud podcast, a Renaud cast, um, where you, you sort of go through chronologically all of these things up into the 21st century all the way back to the 1960s. Um, that's not something I'm interested in doing, but if somebody wants to do a Renaud cast, I think that would be a, a fine use of somebody's time. We will in the future um, during the year be dipping into Bob Renaud's uh, contacts here and there. Uh, next time we're going to be doing something a little different, but uh, then Bob Renaud, not different as far as the show goes, but, but different from Bob Renaud, but we will definitely be returning to uh, to his experiences. We're going to see maybe what happens with Astra Lari. Do we hear anything more about Astra Lari? Um, does he meet the president anymore? Um, how do the Corindians cope with, uh, with with their predictions maybe not coming true? Do they take credit for humanity uh, turning from a dark path, or do they kind of gloss it over and keep predicting doom if we don't continue to change our ways? It's it's interesting and. Um, and Renaud, Renaud fascinates me. This, these are strange, interesting stories. But um, those stories will be for another time. Thank you for listening. And thank you to The Saucer Wife for providing a uh, couple lines of dialogue as Lynn Airy. Um, she was home from work today, so I decided to... Uh, dragoon her into doing this. Remember to send in your questions and comments via the usual social media or email channels for us to address next time. And also remember to try to figure out what item of food he might have been talking about in that one section. I I can't think of anything. Can you eat banana peels? I don't, I don't think that really works, but banana was the first thing that came to my head. Anyway, our associate producer is Simpson J. Hanover III, and The Saucer Life is a production of Chizo Media, LLC. Chizo Media, our heart is with the people. Till next time, keep watching the skies, because the skies are watching you. <laughs>